Welcome to the uh, Basu and Gaudin Notebook. I am Marc Antoine Gaudin with Arpin, who's uh, live from Ottawa. Uh, yeah. Arpin, um, usually on Friday we got Future Friday, so we keep a segment of our podcast towards the end uh, to discuss about a prospect, somebody who will be part of the future, hopefully, of the Montreal Canadiens. But I got a sense that today. Um, Future Friday is going to be most of this podcast. Yes, yes. Well, obviously, the news today with that Lane Hudson has signed his entry level contract with the Canadians. Contract that begins this season, so he gets to burn a year, which is standard procedure for a guy who uh, is such who a premium. Leverage. Who has leverage? Yeah, who could have gone back to college and had had some reason to believe the Canadians were desperate to get him into the organization, which they have said. On numerous occasions that they are so now it's here he will join the team in detroit on sunday evening presumably play in detroit on monday and uh and then perhaps in the season finale on tuesday back at home at the bell center who knows but um but yeah an interesting development and you know really i think so yes we'll ha we're gonna have a largely future friday base show we'll We'll well, get... Let's start. With, let's start with this. I mean, it's the news of the day. There's, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll get, we'll get to the other stuff later on. But I mean, it's, it's literally breaking. I just news. want to make sure we get the Future Friday jingle into the show. That's all I'm saying. So at some point, we Don't will work. stop, and we'll get the jingle in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Gotta, Don't worry about you gotta it. Have, get your priorities straight, man. I know. I know. So yeah, um, I think that the uh, it's it's an interesting exercise. Sometimes. We were just talking about leverage, how it's standard procedure and all that. We, I mean, I remember Charlie Lindgren signing his contract, playing a game at the end of the season. Uh, Ryan Paling a few years back, and with, with with in great fashion that he started off his NHL career. Uh, even last year, Sean Farrell played a bunch of games. Uh, but yeah. I think that for I some of them, it's play. yeah. So for my, for some of them, it's it's a bit of a You give them a lolly, basically, but I think in in the in Lane Hudson's case, it's really about measuring in those two games against a team that potentially will be fighting for its survival. So it, it could be, you know, uh, games of great significance for 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 the Red Wings. So they're going to be a formidable opponent potentially. Uh, so in this case, I think it's a, it's more to measure. The space, you know, how far is Lane Hudson from the NHL? We have he's got NHL talent offensively in terms of skill, but the the all around game. I'm really curious to see to be able to gauge with those two games how far really is he from from the NHL. Well, yeah, I'm curious to see that too, but I don't think it's good to look at those two games as any sort of indicator one way or the other. Listen, he just lost in the Frozen Four, had a long season at BU. It's been a whirlwind. He's showing up. And, you know, I guess David Reinbacker had a similar kind of whirlwind prior to playing his first game for Laval. And ever since mm -hmm. he's been in Laval has shown the, his promise. You know, he's he's reacted well to the situation, but not everyone necessarily does. You know, so I would I would caution fans, media, ourselves to not read too much into it. Like if Lane Hudson stumbles, doesn't mean he's that far from the NHL. And if he dominates, it doesn't mean he's that close to the NHL. So it it, it really it is an interesting test of his mm -hmm. character and his and 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 really what he's he's done throughout his life, which is just show up on big stages and perform. Uh, although I think. That national semifinal is probably one of a game that, you know, maybe he didn't do that to the to the to the utmost of his ability. No. So, um, listen, probably a bad taste in his mouth. He's got a lot. He's going to want to come in and prove a lot of things. But that's the, that's the danger for a young player in this situation is walking into a game, 
at the NHL level and in in the span of one game try to prove all the doubters wrong and try to prove the Canadians right and try to prove you're going to be an all-star and try to do everything all in one shot. So in that sense, it's a test to see if he's able to play within himself. Cause to me, I don't have that much question of his ability to play in the NHL, even defensively. Um, I think he's come up with strategies to overcome his size disadvantage at every level. He's going to come up with strategies at the NHL level. He has excellent feet, um, you know, I think he's going to find ways to get around that and, and defend it adequately, at least. But it's the ability to, you know, what I'm curious to see is, is will he be able to pick his spots in the NHL? And not, I'm not talking about these two games. I'm talking about in his career. Yeah, yeah. Will he be able, will he be able to pick his spots and will he be able to recognize situations that are too risky or too perilous or, just don't call for him to bring out his otherworldly puck skill talents and, and just his offensive vision, everything that he's gifted at, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's one thing to do it. And so just as what made me think of this was the little exchange with Quinn Hughes in Vancouver, our, you know, and our colleague Anthony Martineau, um asked Quinn Hughes a very general question. The question was, how difficult was it for you to make the transition from the NCAA to the NHL? Didn't mention Lane Hudson's name at all. Quinn starts answering the question, says, well, the one thing I had to learn is that I'm not going to beat everyone with my feet. I have to use my teammates more. All things that apply to Lane Hudson. And that he had to, that, that, that this was something he needed to get accustomed to because in college, he obviously could beat just about everyone with his feet. And you can't do that at the NHL level. So you have to know when you can do that. Yeah. And then halfway through the answer says, I think I know why you're asking the question and Lane's going to be fine. <laughs> so, so, and then went on to, sp- then went on to kind of talk about how, you know, just give him time, blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah. and, and, and further, you know, the, just further kind of sp- the whole line of questioning, Anthony did not mention Lane Hudson's name once in two questions. And Quinn Hughes answered both questions as if they were questions about Lane Hudson. And, you know, there's, I guess there's, there's becoming, maybe there's like a small NCAA defenseman fraternity growing. Like it's, 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 it's well, starting. There's a, few. there's a few of them. Yeah. There's a few, you know, Tori Krug was the first, well, I guess he's the original founder and chairman of this, of this group. But, you know, Quinn Hughes obviously is keeping an eye on Lane Hudson and wants to kind of see him succeed. He's kind of, I guess he sees him as, you know, as being, as someone who could expand the group that Quinn Hughes is the, the very small group that Quinn Hughes is a part of yeah. um, as another guy who could be like that. Yeah. So it's uh yeah, you're right. It, it was funny. Uh, the fact that he, he did not, Anthony did not even ask him about Hudson and that's how he didn't he, mention his name once. No. And Quinn Hughes went right there. It was, it was very funny. Anthony got a big kick out of it and came. I put it in my notebook the next day. He's like, yeah, I saw your note. That was good. <laughs> I was yeah. like, yeah, it was funny. I found it funny. You know, it was like, it's, 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 it, and, and it wouldn't have been the case if it was about, I don't know, Owen Power, let's say, let's say the Canadians had Owen Power and, and he was making the jump from Michigan to the NHL. No, I don't no, think no. Quinn, Hughes, case, the Quinn Hughes would not have sure. said, would not have said, I think I know you, I think I know here why you're asking the question and Owen's going to be fine. No. Yeah. This was clearly because it's an undersized defenseman with superlative offensive skills, excellent feet, who can beat guys one and one on the NCAA. And that's why, to me, his first part of that answer was so telling because it, it was almost since he knew that the question was about Lane, it was almost like he was talking to Lane Hudson. It was like it was almost like, listen, you could beat guys with your feet at BU. Don't think you're going to show up in the NHL and you're going to beat guys with your feet here. You got to be able to pick your spots. So. Um, yeah, let's see what I, happens. I think you know those two games. There, it's it. I think that your uh, your your uh, your notice or your uh, you know your uh, caution your your caution sign of saying okay, well, <laughs> don't don't make any harsh judgment is really relevant in this case because I mean I saw online you you, you said that Lane didn't have his best game yesterday. You had. Among other things, a costly turnover that led to mm-hmm. uh, Denver's tying goal, and 
online afterwards it's like oh he's not so good stop uh, praising the kid blah 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 what if we traded him you know it's things get off the rails very fast so people. you don't want you don't want to yes <laughs> hashtag people <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> so so you don't want to get carried away either either way by a, a strong mm -hmm. showing or or something that's a bit more you know whatever that left leaves to be desire or whatever uh but i think it's important for those two games that he that he takes a read on what's the nhl what's the speed mm -hmm. what what will he have to expect from now on because one thing that helped lane hudson generate so much offense at the ncaa level is the amount of time and space that he had Mm -hmm. uh, you could see it on the power play. You could see it four on four. I mean, when there's four on four situation, he's by far the most dominant player on the ice. He, everything goes through him. Power play, same thing. Uh, and, you know, to a lesser level, five on five, he generates, he still generates offense five on five, but I think that it, his specialty has been the power play. But at the NHL level, that space, that time, will be gone. So when you talk about not beating guys with your feet and trying to identify, locate your, 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 your teammates quickly, make your passing game going, that's, that's a key element uh, in, mm -hmm. in making sure that you don't get beat by, by, by the pace that's so much quicker. So those two games will help him try to adjust mentally and get ready throughout the summer uh for the adjustment to the pro life uh and afterwards we'll be able to have a better gauge uh less uh, next fall during training camp how far he really is from the nhl but i think that this is this is a this is a good exercise and you know what yeah. I, i i wouldn't be surprised if they they give logan mayu a similar exercise a similar taste until the uh towards the end of the season well yeah the way the rocket schedule plays out Um, those two games against Detroit would fall into a bit of a a bit of a hole in their schedule, right? So they, he could get one of one or one of them or both or whatever. I mean, yeah, it's very poss it's possible. Um, you know, you mentioned the power play, and I, I'm pretty I'm 99% sure that Martin Saint Louis does not watch our podcast or listen to it. If he does, I would say please play him on the power play. <laughs> Yes. I don't think Mike Matheson would mind giving up his spot for like a power play or two. Um, you know, talk to, talk to Mike about it, but it would just be very interesting to see him on the, on the, on PP1, not yeah. on the second power play. Because if you're going to put him on the second power play, just don't put him on the power play because that is right putting a guy a in a position to fail. Yeah. By putting him on, uh, it's just a waste of time. It's a waste of everyone's time. I honestly, when, when, When Marte puts PP2 out on the ice, he should just throw out three forwards, 2D, whatever whatever line he wants to <laughs> play after the power play. Just put that line out there. Put Jake Evans out there with a, with whoever his wingers would be and just don't bother. So I hope that Marte embraces this opportunity and embraces what how special it'll be. Listen, he's a Michigan native. He's going to be making presumably his NHL debut in Michigan, although it's not clear – He's pretty far from Detroit, actually. He's probably closer to Chicago than than Detroit in terms of his hometown of Holland, Michigan, which is on the western edge of Michigan. Um, but still, home state, NHL debut, he is who he is. Give him a shot on the power play. You know, look, let's just see what he can do. And hopefully he does that. You know, I don't know. It's not that simple. It's easy for me to say these are NHL guys. They're NHL jobs. They take the game seriously. It's not... It's not as an easy equation like, hey, Mike, do you mind? I'm just going to give this kid, you know, whatever. The season's over anyway. What do you care kind of thing? These guys care. They do. So I, I, I could see Marty being uncomfortable taking Mike Matheson's power play duties away from him, especially with the season he's had and, and his, his, the opportunity to kind of add more to his season point total. Yeah, um, he reached 60 points. That's no small feat. He's reached 60 defenseman. points and 50 assists. Like it's – yeah. They're big numbers, but he's already reached those numbers. So I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, I, it would be a shame to put Lane Hudson in an NHL game 
and not give him power play time. But yeah, it's not as, it, it's not it's, it's easier for me to say than it is for Marty to actually do. So yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But we've seen occasions where the first unit stayed on the power play for the whole two minutes. You could leave the you could leave the the forwards there and just yeah. replace Matheson with Hudson at some point. You know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just hope. I just, I just hope he gets a look, you know, even, and not even every power play, like a power play or, or two, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's really, it's not a matter of just permanently taking Matson off of there, but, you know, give him a look there and let's see what he can do. You know, it's, uh, that's the whole point of this whole exercise, as you just mentioned, is to see where he stands. Well, this is a guy who excels on the power play. He's going to be a game changer for this organization on the power play. Um, because of just how shifty he is and how he identifies lanes on the ice better than other, human beings he's just really good at at finding holes in in defenses yeah. and so let's give him a chance to do that and also i'm very happy that he uh that he joins the canadians not just because it gives us a good story for, to finish the season but just from <laughs> his from his standpoint uh i'm not sure that he had any more to learn or to 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 test at the college level because even the things that he's improved uh defensively he needs to measure it up against professional opposition now and see mm. okay does it work because he's so dominant offensively bu has been so dominant offensively that they on most nights they hardly spend any time in their own end yeah. so he doesn't defend all that much so he need he needs to be put in situation where he will have to defend and he will have to learn Um, so there are, I think that there's some, you were talking about, you know, ways to not to avoid, but to, to, to counter the fact that he's a smaller, smaller, uh, player, extremely agile, but, uh, ne not also a huge speedster, but I, I think that the, he's got a certain explosiveness, uh, that can help him in defensive situations, but positioning is going to be extremely important for him. Uh, and defend with his head, defend with his feet, defend with his stick. So there's uh, that's the triumvirate there for him to uh, to uh, to be able to to more than survive defensively. But I think that he's got to be put to the test in professional uh, conditions in order for for him to improve because it become. I think that to a certain extent it became stale. Uh, mm -hmm. earlier this season, I was in, in Burlington in January and I was chatting to, uh, Jay Pendolfo, his head coach at BU. And the number of questions where he said, well, we'll have to see at the next level. We'll have to see at the next level. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, now we have to see at the next level. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, and that's what it's, you know, I also had a chance to talk to Jay Pendolfo over the course of the season. And yeah, that's the thing is that the transferability of his game without the puck Mm -hmm. remains the question. And I think the Canadians have questions about it. Everyone has questions about it and it's normal. You know, the only person who probably doesn't is Lane Hudson himself. But, you know, I think Jay Pandolfo feels very confident that he's going to figure it out just because, you know, the, what did Nick Bobra say when they drafted him? Big brain. I mean, that's, That's the thing with Lane Hudson. And that's why he is going to mesh with Martin St. Louis probably perfectly, I would imagine, just because the big brain aspect of him, the fact that he's able to solve problems on the ice using that brain, it just seems perfectly suited to be coached by this coach. And yeah. it totally really agree. feels, really feels like a match made in heaven. And so, um, and not to mention that the coach understands what it's like to be an undersized player, understands the challenges of it, understands the chip on your shoulder that you get as a result of it. Like all of the, a lot of the things that Lane Hudson has lived through in his life, Martin St. Louis lived through in his, uh, Cole Coffee lived through in his, obviously Brendan Gallagher lived through in his. Um, so he's entering an environment that is really conducive to him succeeding. So let's see. I mean, it's honestly, it's, And, and I think it's time to give props to this scouting staff. I remember I was, I was speaking to Nick Bobrov. So the year after whatever, I guess it would have been in, in, in 22 at the rookie tournament. And I was watching, um, or I was, I was chatting with Nick Bobrov. I was like, how did you, 
how did you feel? Like you seem really enamored and you're really proud that you were able to pick Lane Hudson, but it was still their third pick of the second round, if I'm not mistaken. They took Beck. Uh, no, they, they, it was the second pick of the second round. Second they took pick. Beck. Yeah. yeah, they took Beck at the top of the second round and waited all the way to the bottom to get Hudson. I was like, how are you so – because I thought that they should have – I remember after day one had passed, I was like, man, they better use that pick on Hudson. You know, like that yeah. that first pick of the second round, they should take Lane Hudson. I was convinced. Yeah. And when they didn't, I was like, okay, well, that's it. They're not getting him unless they could trade up. And Nick said that they were like 95% sure he was going to be there at pick 62 or whatever it was. I think it was 62. Um that he would be there. And, you know, this is something the scouting staff does a lot. They do a lot of like, they do, they spend a lot of time on mock drafts and, but not mock drafts like you and I do them, like mock drafts that are informed, that are based on, (laughs) that are based on Intel that they've they've gathered over the course of the season and which teams are watching which players and, and what teams need what, what teams draft tendencies are. And they had done that whole exercise and were very, very confident that Lane Hudson would be sitting there, when it was their turn to pick at the bo- at the bottom of the second round, and they turned out to be right. So now let's see if the payoff is going to be there. You know, I mean, yep. that's that's, but I think it will be personally. It's similar to Jacob Fowler. I mean, uh, Kent Hughes mentioned to the Journal de Montréal uh, in Minnesota, the Frozen Four, that they mm-hmm. had considered using the thirty seventh pick on Jacob Fowler. They decided to wait. And right. they were able to to nab him in the third round. So once again, it's about mm. reading the draft, reading the you know what the the intentions of other teams, and figuring out what's the sweet spot to get a guy. Because when you know that you can wait, um, then you wait because there are other guys that you might like too that are going to be more popular, and mm-hmm. there, there's there's a there's a right time for each guy. Um, you know, that we I think that we're going to uh, discuss a little bit Florian Jackai later on. Mm-hmm. Everybody was, su- was surprised by the fact that the Canadians jumped on him in the fourth round, where probably other teams did not even consider him. But they might have. I'm sure that they had some. They they liked him enough that they knew other teams were interested around that time, and they they yeah. they could not wait any longer. So if they wanted him, they needed to draft him. At that spot, and you know, you know what makes them waiting on Hudson even more impressive is that two picks before the Canadians took Lane Hudson, the Carolina Hurricanes were picking at number sixty. And if there's one organization that was going to go outside the box and take this this outlier of a player mm-hmm. um, and take a chance on a guy like Lane Hudson, it would be the Carolina Hurricanes. And they still they did kind of double down on. You know, they they wound up taking Gleb uh, Gleb Trip- Trikazov, who they just signed, I, I believe. Yes, um, they did. Yeah, so so he's a guy who slid because of the Russia factor. So they did kind of stick to their um, stick to their, I guess, template mm-hmm. of 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 trying to find value in the draft the way they do. But like Lane Hudson would have been a candidate for them to do that, and they must have known they had to have known that Carolina wasn't going to take him. Or they were just willing to take the chance that they wouldn't, but because you know who knows if Trikasov is gone by then, maybe they maybe they nab him. Who knows? But yeah, that's but we'll that, see. that's possible. And the other guy that was like a comparable for Hudson at that draft was Matthias Havelid, um, the Swedish defenseman who was taken forty fifth overall by the San Jose Sharks. And he's still listed to this day at five foot nine, 165 pounds. So Uh pretty similar to Lane. And, uh, he had, he had had like amazing world juniors. And I remember speaking to some, uh, some scouts who were enamored with Havilid. So his, his stock seemed higher. And Uh I remember one, one, one scout in particular I was couldn't stop praising Havlid, but he still had time for Hudson. But it's not just that you know oh, we're allergic to you to small defensemen, no way that we're gonna take them, because obviously the Sharks took Havlid. Uh it took about forty five, seventeen spots before Hudson. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, I know. So that that's that's rather significant. So maybe that the, there was place in people's hearts and minds for one of those defensemen and it was Havlid. I don't know how it turned out that I mean it was Hudson was still available but they knew what they were doing and uh yeah and good on them good on them yeah. it's 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 rightful praise what one thing though that I'm curious and I'll need to ask uh Martin Lapointe and I'll need to ask Nick Barbroff too um you know Barbroff brought a new philosophy when he came in as co-director of scouting department but uh, of, of uh, amateur scouting But it's largely, for the most part, it's still the same staff. So I wonder to which extent you can say, oh, well, it's all him and it's all a, a an empowered Martin Lapointe that make the difference from from the Trevor Timmons years. Because the, the group, the boots on the ground, it's roughly the same group than under Timmons. So is it possible that, yes, you change your leader, But the philosophy that changes with your new person at the top has an influence on the way that your soldiers are working on the ground, on the field, and basically changes those guys into maybe something they become slightly different scouts than they were under the previous regime because maybe that they're asked to look at certain things differently than they were asked before. I don't know, but we talk about the new scouting staff but it's roughly one new head scout and one guy who's been empowered into that position. Yeah. I mean, you know, they did, they did draft Mete as a fourth round pick admittedly, but not, um, you know, yeah. but still, I mean, they, they took, they took a chance on him. They got, they put him in the lineup. They, 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 they kind of fast tracked him to the NHL. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. This, No, that's yeah. So that it's not as if it's unprecedented, is what I'm saying. Like it's it's yes, it's it kind of went against their beliefs in terms of defense. I mean, they drafted Harris in the third round. Harris is not exactly a prototypical big defenseman, you know. I mean, he's he's a guy who's who even back then they knew was going to make it because of his feet. Um, so I think there's some similarity there. Uh, so it's not. You know, I, I don't know if I don't know all that to say is like I don't know if Martin Lapointe necessarily had to be had to switch camps, you know. Like it's it's I think there was they they've had some openness to this. Um they drafted Cole Caulfield, they drafted, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of undersized players, like it's not they yeah. you know, they have they have gone down this road before Cam Hillis was another one. Um so it's and that's just to name a few, but it's it's Sometimes you're just presented with such a, a tantalizing toolbox that um, that you just can't you just can't ignore it, you know. And 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 it's and the funny thing is is that the same group are just gaga over Owen Beck, like they are so happy to have Owen Beck because they feel Owen Beck is the type of player that teams win with in the playoffs, mm -hmm. particularly. And so you have Owen Beck, who is like really the prototypical shutdown center type that you you kind of anchor a shutdown line around, um, a really typical pick, traditional hockey pick. And then you have Lane Hudson in the same round, at the opposite end of the same round, who is the opposite of that, mm -hmm. who is anything but traditional in terms of who you win with in the playoffs. But... I mean, honestly, like you, you look at what Quinn Hughes is doing, and I'm not saying Lane Hudson's going to be Quinn Hughes. Quinn Hughes was the seventh overall pick. He was, he was, it's not the same thing. But if even Quinn Hughes considers it kind of the same thing, then maybe we should start considering the possibility that maybe Lane Hudson is in at least the same category of player as Quinn Hughes without giving him the same ceiling at this point. Um, you know, I mean, I think Quinn Hughes himself – seeing that uh, there's there's good reason for Canadians reporters to be asking me questions about Lane Hudson without them even doing so. Yeah. And it gives you a basic idea of what Quinn Hughes thinks of Lane Hudson's game in comparison to his own. 
Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. But again, yeah. let's not get over ourselves. <laughs> just get no, it, so. no, no, no. Well, that's it. We just spent we spent a half hour talking about a guy who was no, but I mean, it's inter- yet, but still, it's it's inter- it, well, it's interesting because I I know that the fan base has been waiting for this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. We've, I mean, I've 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 been to Boston to watch him, then to Burlington to watch him. He's been, you know, he's been a focal point of the Canadians' pipeline for two years now. So and and rightfully so. So it's it, it's good that we. But okay, I, I want there, there's something though I wanted to add because you mentioned the name uh, Jordan Harris, who's mm-hmm. who's probably going through his best stretch in the Montreal Canadiens uniform the I, last I few weeks. Def- definitely going through his best stretch, I think. And um, but he's not the biggest guy. Do you think that now that Hudson is signed, if uh, If Hudson hits at the NHL level, it's further bad news for Harris, just considering the idea that the Canadians might not want two smaller size defensemen in their top six. Um, I mean, I spoke to Harris about this a few weeks ago in Vancouver. We were in Vancouver, so whenever that was. And, um, you know, he has a very as you won't be surprised to hear, but a very pragmatic kind of view of this whole situation. And his view of it is nothing is bad news for me. I control what becomes bad news for me is bad. I'm paraphrasing. This is, he didn't say these words, but this is basically what he meant. Is that yeah. yes, there's a lot of young defensemen in the organization. Yes. They're coming up. Yes. I'm going to have to compete for my spot, but that's, that's always going to be the case. Like this is the NHL. You're always going to have to compete to stay in the NHL. So just because we have a lot of young defensemen doesn't make it any different than if I were on any other team. Like it's, but I don't think the thing about Harris that I don't think he should be threatened by, by Lane Hudson necessarily is that what's become clear in Harris is that his plus element is his defense. Mm-hmm. It's not his offense. Um, so Lane Hudson's not stepping on his toes. Um, you know, one day, You know, he, he, in a best case scenario, like, I mean, it's more Matheson that Hudson would be kind of taking that role, not, not necessarily as a number one defenseman who plays 25 minutes a night, but as a guy who has a bit of risk to his game, who will try to beat people, try to make things happen offensively. He doesn't have the well-rounded nature of Matheson's game in the defensive end yet. Um, some people would argue that Matheson still doesn't have that, but I, I would disagree with them. Um, but when Matson entered the league, that was his issue. Like it was his issue was learning how to balance his offensive gifts with the need to be a play a responsible game and be sound defensively in his own end. Like he had a lot of the same challenges that Hudson's going to have over the next few years. And so add Matheson to the list of guys that is good for Lane Hudson to be exposed to. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I mentioned St. Louis, I mentioned Caulfield and Gallagher. Mike Matheson's going to know a lot of, is going to be able to relate to a lot of the decision-making quandaries that Lane Hudson is going to go through over the next little while. Like Mike Matson goes through them still today, but yeah. especially when he entered the NHL um, also after his sophomore season, if I'm not mistaken at Boston college, or was he a junior anyhow um, that he, he had those same things to, to, to manage. And frankly, didn't do a very good job of it until he got to Pittsburgh, you know, and he spent a lot of time, you know, he played three seasons at Boston college, sorry, but you know, he spent five years in Florida, four year, four full seasons in Florida trying to figure that out. And, um, his guidance in that area. And I've talked to him extensively about it. I think, you know, a lot of people have, but, um, you know, his guidance in that specific element of the game of learning, what is appropriate when, um, when to use your gifts and when to hold back, like exactly what we said off the top of the show, that it's going to be interesting to see how Lane Hudson does in that area. Mike Matson is, mm-hmm. has lived it, continues living it. will probably always live it as an NHL player. And, and, and at toward later in his career, man, maybe his feet are not as elite as they are now. He's going to have to go through it again. because he's going to, he's going to have to relearn, what situations he can beat people in because his feet have slowed down a little bit. Um, and so this is going to be probably a constant 
study for Lane Hudson, and it's it's really good for him to have uh, an in-house case study to learn from, uh, which is Mike Matheson. Well, as long as the Boston College guy is willing to help the Boston University guy, that's what, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. Everything's going to be exactly. okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think so. Let's move on a little bit now. Um, you're in Ottawa, and um, the Canadians are going to be facing the Senators on Saturday. They lost their first two games of the season against the Sens, and uh, we discussed uh, when the Arizona Coyotes seem to be the Salt Lake City Coyotes or the Salt Lake City, whatever. Um, the the last time that the Coyotes were in Montreal, we discussed the fact that it was a four-point game uh, from the bottom and that uh, it yeah. had implications when it came to the lottery. Uh, we, didn't we didn't see a lot of those games since then, but uh, there's definitely a case to be made that on Saturday against Ottawa, uh, it is going to be a four-point game in regards to the lottery. Mm -hmm. Um Obviously, players don't see it that way, but how do you see the balance between what we can hope for for the sake of the lottery and the desire for the Canadians to make sure that they don't get swept by Ottawa and that they also offer a better showing than what we saw last night in Long Island? Well, I mean, yeah, well, they don't give a shit about the lottery. Let's just start that. You know, I mean, there's no... There's no deep analysis to be made there. These guys, the players, coaching staff, I think... I mean, maybe if, again, if you slip some seats, truth serum to management, they would prefer they lose this game. But generally speaking, the Canadians don't want to get swept by Ottawa. Mike Madsen said it flat out. It's very important to them that they manage to beat Ottawa. They don't know. It, it bothers them that Ottawa has their number. And so, um, but to me, it's it's what's striking is that You know, the Canadians as an organization should be looking at Ottawa, and we've talked about this, but you have you know, Ottawa, Detroit, Detroit, right? Ottawa is where the Canadians have to be mindful of winding up in that situation. Detroit is represents kind of the best case scenario for the Canadians next season, that they can replicate what Detroit did this season. And they also had another case against Philadelphia, you know, where they could replicate what they did this season. Two teams that were not necessarily expected to compete for a playoff spot but are. Two teams in this division, uh, Ottawa, Canadians face on Saturday, and obviously Buffalo, who is um, about to match a North American professional sports record, if I'm not mistaken, for, for consecutive years or at least an active streak. I, I don't forget what it is, but it'll be 13 years out of the playoffs for the Sabres. Um, and just a just a mess of a situation. And so it's it's – You know, there's there's definitely a transition that the Canadians want to make this offseason. It's not clear what exactly it is, but the end goal is to avoid being what Ottawa became this season and to become what Detroit became this season. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to follow the template of what Detroit did or avoid what Ottawa did or whatever, but it's definitely those are the two. The, like if the Canadians are at a fork in the road, those are the two directions of the road that they're kind of looking at right now. And um, so it's unfortunate for the Canadians that they find themselves looking at lottery standings again for a third year in a row. Of course. But it's, I think that the Canadians, what they believe would help them avoid the Ottawa Buffalo thing is their culture and their character. Now, they haven't proven that they have excellent culture or excellent character, uh, but they feel they have. They feel they've shown something by in the way that they've performed against better teams, uh, in the way that they've stayed in games against teams that probably should have them overmatched. Even that game in, in New York, you know, I mean, even that game against the Islanders, that's a, that's a team desperate to secure a playoff berth. Yes, the Canadians didn't look very good doing it, but they were in position to win that game in the third period. You know, it's 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 they were up 2-1 in the third. They still got a point out of it. They got to overtime again. They've been competitive and, and it's not hard for them to look at this season and say, "Man, a couple of overtime goals, a couple of 
bounces in one goal games, could this, that, this, that, and and we're right there, especially considering yeah, the point they total. Forty one. They got forty one one goal games over the course of the season. Exactly. So. so there's a lot of there's a lot of room for variance there. Um but I don't know the extent to which I buy that, but it's it's just like it's you know, the whole notion of sustainable success mm-hmm. is there's no set formula for it. If there were, then then Buffalo wouldn't be in the situation they're in, and Ottawa wouldn't be in the situation they're in, and even go so far as Edmonton. Like, I mean, if like if Edmonton doesn't win the Stanley Cup this year, yes, they've built an excellent team. It's taken forever. They had four number one overall picks along the way. Um, it's even they don't have didn't have the formula, and it took you know it took getting a generational talent and hitting on another mega star talent, like not at number one overall, but still excellent pick with the dry saddle pick. Uh, and a lot of, a lot of trial and error along the way since then to, to get to where they are now. And it took a while. Toronto hasn't won anything. No. I thought their, I thought their formula was great. Hasn't produced think- a single, has produced one playoff round victory. Yeah. But I think you could, you could argue from a, Toronto standpoint that had it not been for all those years where the cap stayed flat, they would have been able to spend more money, more of their available money on defensemen and because they were so, or on depth players that didn't pay the league minimum. But as, as it was, they were so uh, top heavy, uh, you know, both on their, for their, their scores and their top defense pair that ultimately there was probably, not enough depth for for help to uh for them to to win properly. Yeah. I think they're more balanced this year. Edmonton's more balanced this year. But there's progress in those but when you talk about sustainable success, it's also that the teams that are good they stay good for a long time. So that makes the bad teams it's even more challenging for them to go up the standings because you have to you know push somebody down the mountain. Uh, because those teams are well anchored. Even a team like like the Tampa Bay Lightning, who might not uh-huh. be like this dominant force, their culture is so solid. Uh, they have their their stars are still playing amazingly. Uh, they're gonna they're they're tough to beat. And you've got in each conference, you got half a dozen of those teams that, I mean, good luck trying to 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 beat them right now. So. I think that there's, but to your point, that there's there's no template. You're right, and the Canadians, they, I don't think that they're going to go necessarily. They might choose to go the the Red Wings way. And they got to a point where they had not, they had tanked, they had not won through the lottery, and now they they're not in a position to tank anymore. And basically, that they're they've tried to buy them themselves out of misery, and mm-hmm. uh, I. I'm not sure to which extent it's going to be effective. They still need their young players to their their best prospects to hit. The Canadians will find their own formula, but yeah. uh, but I find that there's you can tell there's more progress from last season to this season in their level of uh, level not the compete level but how competitive they are mm-hmm. in games. There's a bigger improvement there than what I guess the Senators can see from their team from one year to the other for the past three or four years. So there's there's an improvement there, and I mean, who knows? The Canadians could be next year's Flyers, and they go from bottom of the standings to a team that surprisingly battles for a playoff spot. You just don't, and I wouldn't mind if that happened. That'd be fun. You just want to make sure that it's not a one-off. And that it uh, it's a reflection of the steps that the team has truly taken, and it's not just oh well, you know, because the Flyers there's something that's a bit fishy. I look at them, and I'm thinking that they might not be for real, and next year they might be down again in the, in, in the standings. I'd rather for the Canadians to take their time, make sure that they do things properly, and as they climb, they're not going to go down the mountain. Well, I think what. You know, the, and the flyer, the Canadians rather have have a lot of push from below, right? There's mm-hmm. there's more young players turning pro. 
every year. Um, I think Rhinebacker's going to be an important piece of their any future success they have. Hudson, who's obviously just arriving now. Um, we'll see what happens with, uh, you know, like there's there's a lot of wild card, you know, like Meshar is a wild card. You know, who knows what he's actually going to turn into. Uh, Beck's another one. It's it's well, Beck's a bit of less of a wild card, but probably the Canadians consider him a piece. So like those guys, that's what I find kind of hard to, I guess, uh, nail down is like, you know, Suzuki's 24. By the time, let's say Owen Beck is like a real bona fide. Let's say he hits like a ceiling of being like a really, really, really good third line center. Let's say. Andrew Cup. Sure. Um, he'll be what, 20? Like, that'll take like three, four years for that to come to pass, minimum. Mm-hmm. You know, by then, Suzuki's pushing 30 almost. Like, it's like, it's, it's such a delicate, and this is what I find so interesting in, in all these rebuilds, and especially the Canadians one, is like, you really have to nail when your window opens and you have to go hard at it once it does, because it's not going to stay open for very long. The Tampa Bay lightning are an outlier. They, they have managed to keep this window open much longer than most teams in the cap era have been able to. And they've done it despite losing just massive amounts of talent over the years um, to Boston's an outlier. Then too, Boston's because... also an outlier, but like, that's why. So like, it's, so yeah, like we'll see, you know, we'll see if Colorado can have a nice long window here. They probably can, you know. So, but you know, what's the commonality between you know Boston? I guess well, even Boston, like you know, I'd put Pasternak and McAvoy as you know foundational pieces that that Boston can ride. You know, obviously Kucherov, Point, Stamkos, Hedman in Tampa, Vasilevsky. and Vasilevsky. Yeah, like like these cornerstone pillar pieces that the Canadians do or don't have, and, and I would lean towards don't, right? Like it's, it's Nick Suzuki's an excellent player. Will he become that level of superstar talent in the NHL? Like a, a foundational pillar piece on a perennial Stanley cup contender. It's hard to say that with any degree of confidence that he will, even though I think he's proving that his ceiling's a lot higher than you or I, or a lot of people gave him credit for going into this season that might be a ceiling too high, you know? And so, so what is the, that sustainable success remains a bit of a mystery still for this team, because I feel like those foundational, like maybe slap will be one of those foundational pillar mm-hmm. pieces, pieces, you know, that's a possibility. Um, maybe Hudson. will. No, no, they, they, for sure. They need more. They need more. But I think, it's you. You really hit it right on the nail when you mentioned that uh, the 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 timing of it all. Saying so you can you you might want to take your time to do it right. Yeah. But do you want to reach a point where Suzuki ends up in his late twenties and all of a sudden you know you got a declining Mike Matheson and you're always and and the tricky part also is that you've got right now. The Canadians' best forwards are in their are in their prime or entering their prime. Yeah, but the promise of the rebuild comes from the blue line, and and defensemen take longer to develop and and reach their prime. So how will you manage to align that? It's going to yeah. be a tricky thing. Um, but yeah, so all this to say, they're they're coming back. They're they're going to try to beat Ottawa. Uh, a team that's been threading water, and uh, Ottawa's Ottawa's presenting a, a style of play that's always in your face against the Canadians. They and the Canadians like to show that they're able to to counter and they're able to play uh, a, a scrappy game when needed. Mm-hmm. Uh, they played against the Islanders yesterday, and the Islanders decided to shut things down and play ultra defensive hockey because that's that's how they need to play in order to win because they don't have apart from Matthew Barzell they don't have the big guns up front um, and the Canadians tried to mold and adapt there's also so th- th- there was this discussion that y- 
you had this question to uh, to Martin Saint Louis. I think it was ten days ago, or something about um, about th- a point where the Canadians could not only define their identity, let's say, as a group, but on the ice, will there be a point where they will stop adapting to what the the other team proposes? And the Canadians simply counters and say, we'll adjust depending on who's our adversary, how they play, and we'll be able to play many different styles. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're going to be able to impose their will and say, this is the Canadians' way of playing hockey, and this is how we're going to beat you. And I didn't sense from Martin Saint-Louis that there was this eagerness to say, yeah, we're going to be that sort of team that's going to impose their will and impose our style of hockey against everybody. Yeah, well, I think, you know, the reason I asked that is because there were two things. So I think that happened, I think that conversation happened either on last Monday or last Tuesday. So it was just before they faced the Panthers. And so he was being asked questions about the Panthers and you're like, yeah, we know what we're going to get. They're they're going to hit us all over the ice. They're going to they're going to be they're going to be in our face. They're going to they're going to be on top of us. Um, we know what we're going to get. Physical team, we have to be able to respond to that. Prior to that, mm-hmm. it was Carolina. Marte St. Louis, we know exactly what we're going to get. They play the same way all the time. Dump it in, dump it out. High pressure all over the place. We're going to have to learn to live with that pressure. And the game prior to that was Philadelphia. The Canadians won that game. But prior to that game, John Tortorella was asked, what do you see, about, what do you see from the Canadians heading into this game? He's like, I have no idea. I haven't watched a second of the Canadians play. And so I brought that up to Marty and Marty obviously laughed knowing Torch the way he does and knowing, maybe knowing that Torch was lying, that he was actually, that he actually <laughs> had watched video on the Canadians. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's just a contrast to the way, and, and, you know, and Marty loves to, um, He's often said that the part about coaching that he loves the most is watching the opposing team, trying to yeah. find the holes in the opposing team, and trying to find ways to exploit those holes. Um, earlier this season, when they faced the Kings, Marty had what he thought was a very good game plan to beat that 1-3-1. Unfortunately, they gave up the first goal, so it allowed the Kings to drop back, but they had they had strategies for beating that. But again, in that game, it seemed they got so bogged down in their own strategies to beat that that they didn't just say, let's just play the way we play and we'll beat it that way kind of thing. And so I guess that's the pull and the, the push and pull of being a team in the situation that the Canadians are in. Yeah. And I think that's what Marty wanted to say, but couldn't really say publicly is that we're not good enough to initiate, to impose our will on teams. We're not good enough to walk into a building and say, this is how we play and you're going to deal with it. Where they are in their development, they need to find any advantage they can get because their own identity and their own style of play is not a big enough advantage for them yet. When that switches, who knows? But maybe at that point, if Marty's still the coach here, which I have no reason to believe he won't be, um, maybe at that point you, you switch your focus. You know, and say, I don't really care if we know exactly what they're going to do. We're going to make them think that they know exactly what we're going to do and that they have to react to it. Yeah. And But they're not, they're not there yet. They're not there as a team. They don't have the depth of talent to do that. So they need to find every little advantage that they could find, any inefficiency in the opposing team that they can exploit – Um, and I think it's just, it's just realistic for where they are as a team. And I, I I truly do believe in this, you know, we've talked about this before, like the coach that Marty will be when this team is, has expectations, which I think they're going to start to have next season, but like real legitimate expectations. Like we, we hope to compete for a Stanley cup this year. I think he's going to be a very different coach than he is right now. What kind of coach he's going to be. It's hard to say. Today he was being asked about how positive the vibe is around the team, despite the fact, uh, despite the fact that they uh, they're out of a playoff spot again, and just kind of playing out the string. Yeah. 
and he, you know, he, he kind of said like, it's, 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 I have passion for hockey and it's, we're going to keep it positive for now, but it's at some point that's going to switch where this is going to have to be unacceptable. The losses are unacceptable. I will not look for positives and losses. They're obviously not there now. So it's hard to like criticize him for doing that. And it's hard to preemptively criticize him for not doing that when we don't know what he'll be like when they have those expectations. But you know, they're definitely, this team's at a crossroads. It's really, it really is. And, and the crossroads is that this game against the Ottawa Senators, they have to tell themselves that we want this to be the last game we ever play where the lottery odds are in play. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's a, that's a, that's a good word or good mantra to keep. But, you know, when we talked about, we mentioned Boston and, and Tampa earlier. They've been, they've been, whether come from Martin Saint Louis or from Kent Hughes, they've been used as examples very often because there are teams that, in both cases, they've been used as examples of teams where guys come from other teams or they're brought up from the minors, from juniors or whatever, and they're included into something that whoever is in the lineup, they're going to play that way, and it's going to be the the Boston Bruins way or mm-hmm. the Tampa Bay Lightning way. Uh, so the Canadians, I know that St. Louis aspires as that too, and he wants to get to a point where who matters show, who, whoever shows up and puts on the sweater, they're going to be able to, to get to that point. But you cannot, you cannot have a, a situation or an environment where no matter who plays, there's a certain way of playing and at the same time wanting to, adjust and tweak and adapt to your opponent every night. It's to a certain extent, it's one or the other. And mm-hmm. you know how um, the 2018 St. Louis blues have been a beacon of hope for all the, the, the weak link proponents. And uh, if we can just get into the playoffs proponents, uh, mm-hmm. because obviously they're, they're, they're a Stanley cup run in 2018. One of the things that we used to hear a lot about that team was they can beat you different ways. Mm-hmm. They can adjust their style. They can they can play rough. They can they can play the skill game. They can win with depth, etc., with special teams. And again, it might be also as much as they were an outlier to do what they did on their way to the cup, the way of being that sort of team that will adapt and adjust and and beat you different ways. Mm-hmm. Uh It might be also something of an outlier and something that most teams, when you've worked on your identity a lot and you're w- working on your way of playing, you basically you you outwill the opponent and you you sh- you tell everybody, well, this is going to work on our terms. And yeah. I too hope that we get to that point with the Montreal Canadiens. Okay, so we're getting very close to the point where we're not going to get the future Friday jingle. So I want to get the future Friday. (laughs) Let's go to future Friday and the jingle future Friday. All right. So we talked about Hudson. Um, yeah. Florian let's Jack make it guy. a melting pot. Let's make it uh, yeah. a potpourri. Yeah. <laughs> potpourri. Well, you know what I find like what's what's fascinating to me about the Frozen Four, and maybe this shouldn't apply here, but I remain like I'm I'm high on David Reinbacher. I think he's going to be a really, really, really good defenseman for the for the mm-hmm. Canadians um, for many years. Uh, and, and his toolkit is, is really, is, is rare, but you know, you watch Boston college play, you watch Ryan, Ryan Leonard, you watch Ryan Leonard play I know. and it's like, man, like that guy, that guy is going to be a problem for the Washington capitals or for Washington capitals opponents for many, many years. Like he is a problem. And yeah. like, that's the guy I know everyone will always think what a missed opportunity with Matt B. Mitchkov, 
me, the guy going into the draft that I thought that they should take was Ryan Leonard. And, and I could be wrong. Like, listen, it's, it's, well, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm going to be wrong that Ryan Leonard's going to be a good player, but like that they should have taken him over Ryan Backer. I could be mm-hmm. wrong about, but you watch him and on that stage and just the, the ferocity of his game and like just the competitiveness and it's man, it's, it's hard to not think that the Canadians might have missed an opportunity there to get a unicorn style player to use one of Nick Bobrov's favorite terms. But it's 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 such a gamer, huh? He, just uh, a, just a yeah. Yeah, and he so, does it all on the ice. He might not he'll probably not going to be like the first, top scorer on this team, but that doesn't matter. It's not it's not just a no. matter of points. It's a matter of what's your impact on the ice overall. Yeah. Like every shift. You know, he's like relentless yeah. and it's 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 power, it's grit, it's skill. There's a there's a lot it's to all of it. there. It's all of it. Yeah. So anyhow, not to not to belabor the point because it's not he's not a Canadian's draft pick, but good pick, Washington Capitals. I think he's I think he's gonna be a hell of a player. Um but Jacob Fowler. I mean Jacob Fowler kind of got lost in the shuffle in the, the BC semifinal because they kind of took care of business relatively easily, but well, still 32 saves, 32 Not saves. Good. Yeah. You know, wasn't like, what's Jacob Fowler's calling card. Jacob Fowler's calling card is to make the save at the moment yeah. when it's necessary. Um, mm-hmm. He's had other games that looked like blowouts earlier this season where he prevented Boston college from being blown out. Gave them yeah. time to find their game and allowed them to wind up blowing out teams. So, but overall this season, Jacob Fowler to me just really looks like he's going to be the best goalie to come out of that draft. He was the third goalie picked, fourth, no, fourth goalie picked in that draft. Am I not mistaken? I think it was the fourth. Yeah. Guyan, Rabel, Augustine. Yeah. And then I think Fowler. there was another. There was no. I think there was a, a one from uh, f- from Europe too. Yeah, I think he might have been the fifth. Keep talking. I'll look. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, it's uh, it is, it is, just his play. You know, you think of the Canadians draft video, the debate they were having, Billy Ryan and and Vincent and the whole thing. Like this guy just wins. This guy just wins. It's it's you see it now, yeah. like he's kind of the goalie version of Ryan Leonard, kind of like he's like he's he's everything we were saying about Ryan Leonard, he brings to the goaltending position. He's a gamer, and it's just it's encouraging. It's encouraging for, um, oh here here's the guy you're looking, Damian Damian oh oh and Damian the- Clara. Clara, that's it. So Clara. basically, yeah. So yeah, there's so two. Bjarnason and Clara. Yeah. So Fowler went and then Fowler. So you got Car- Guyan was yes. the first, Rabal, Augustine, Bjarnason, Clara, then Fowler. That's it. Clara is from Faryastad. Yeah. And so he, so Fowler could be, I haven't followed those other five guys. <laughs> I mean, Augustine obviously kind of had a um, a disappointing end to his season, obviously, but uh, but yeah, I think the Canadians. Great I think World Junior, something. though. Great World Junior, and 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 beat out Fowler for the number one job on that team. But I think the Canadians have something special here with Fowler. He's he's really proving them right in that regard. And and as you mentioned earlier, them sort of playing the field and and understanding that Fowler would be there in the third round, although the Canadians traded away their second round pick, so they didn't really have much of a choice. They had to hope he'd be there. Um, but yeah, that's uh, good on them for that one. What I liked from Fowler against Michigan is that um, he's so he's, there's so much poise in his game, and a, a lot has been made of the fact that he's not the biggest goalie, you know, six foot one, he's not, it's it, it bothers some some scouts out there that you know he's for a goalie it's it's small nowadays. Yeah. Um but I saw yesterday there were times where Michigan managed to put some traffic in front of him and he's not moving left, right, and center, trying to 
locate the puck and and show any sort of nervousness from that traffic. It's as though he sees through those <laughs> through those guys, and uh-huh. he remains square on the puck no matter what. And he's been he was so economical with his movements last night. There was a, a at some point in late in the third. There's a, a Michigan player that makes a rush from the uh, from the right of of Fowler, and you know he arrives from the flank with speed and then hooks to the net the way the way that that Josh Anderson used to do you know prior to this season, right? And uh, and so, so Fowler's there and he just whoop, he just gives a little poke with his stick and the threat is gone. But it was so economical. It's not just that that big movement with with exaggerated. No, it was surgical. Uh-huh. And I saw him earlier live uh, in a game in Boston, and I thought he was he was fighting it a lot more, especially in the first two periods. But in the third, he regrouped and was really a difference maker in the win uh, in, in a win for Boston College. But I think that. The, This is what we could see. Yes, he was not necessarily a difference maker because the offense took care of it, which is often the case with with Boston College. Mm -hmm. But there's just the whole – the way that he made those 32 saves and had that shutout, the difference he made was he sent the message to Michigan, sorry, guys, it's not going in. He was was deflating to the opponent. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily like being like the difference maker and if he was not here – we would have lost, but it's just what he projected. Yeah. So that and that's really comforting, I thought. So we, he's going to have another big task uh, during the finals of the, the in the Frozen Four finals because Denver is another powerhouse offensively. Mm-hmm. So he might have his hands full because over the course of the season, Boston College won a lot with their offense. But I'm not sure if in right in front of Fowler. They initially have the most structured defense scheme that makes it so that they support their goalie. He's he's had to face uh, his fair share of, of of shots and scoring chances. So it'll be it might be a different type of of game uh, on Saturday. So I look forward to seeing that. Yeah, and so just in conclusion, um, we should kind of just sum up what's going on with Laval. A little bit um, and some of the things that might be happening here. So, yeah. Um, so Laval lost, uh, Laval lost in Cleveland um, the other night. Oh, man. Yeah, uh, bad. yeah. Bad. I mean, you know, they, they got the game, they tied the game up 4 4 and then um, yeah. just couldn't, couldn't come all the way back. But so now they got three games left. They're two points behind the Senators. They have a game against Cleveland. Tomorrow night, Saturday night, or Saturday, I should say, um, in Cleveland, and uh, they have then they have two games left, both against Belleville, which is a team they're chasing in the standings. Now Belleville has two more games to play; they're two points ahead of the Rocket. Uh, I think the notion of catching the Marlies is probably out of the question at this point, but it's could happen. They're four points behind them, but it's you know Joshua Roy, is around the team. His injury timeline had him coming back four to six weeks. And yeah. that was on March 21st. And so go four to six weeks from March 21st. And you're pretty much here. Almost. You're, you're at three weeks now. So, he could be back for those final two games. Like basically like can the Canadians load up the rocket for those final two games? Are we going to see Logan Mayu play in one or both of the Canadians final two games? Um, it's there's, 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 there's James Trouble going to go back to Laval for those final two games. Like there's all sorts of things that could happen here, but the rocket can't lose in another game basically. No, they can't, and they need they need the the teams in front of them to lose them all too. Belleville is going to play three games before they face Laval. Yeah, they just won four in a row, and the Rocket needs them to lose all three before they have a chance to beat them twice. 
in two days. So yeah. that's a tall order. When it comes to the Marlies, who still have five games to go, same deal. And they, they're, they're, they're even higher in the standing. So they need to lose them all. So that, that's, you want to, to put it into the simplest equation possible. The Rocket needs to win all of their games and the two teams that they're after need to lose all of their games. Good luck with that. So <laughs> yeah, it's not so, great. It's really not great. So you're talking about Well, I mean the, the one thing, thing is, the one thing is that they do have the ability to deliver those two final losses to Belleville. If they lose three in a row um between now and then. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, we'll know. I mean, We're recording uh, this podcast on Friday afternoon. Belleville is playing tonight uh, against Rochester. So we could have a beginning of an answer to that uh, very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but you mentioned the possibility. I mean, if if the Rockets out of the picture early in the week because of what other teams will have done, and they're going to play also in Cleveland. So if they lose against Cleveland, well, it's 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 gone for for the Rocket. I, I'd be really curious to see what they're going to do with Logan Mayu and if they're going to bring him up uh, for a couple of games uh, and use him on the right side, which would mean, I guess, uh, on top of my head, and it's really not, I'm not privy to any insider information in that regard, but I would suppose they would mean sending down Justin Barron um, because... Well, they wouldn't even have to, really. They could just bring Mayu up. And, yeah, uh, but the Rocket will still need six defensemen. They don't have an extra. Well, they, they just they won't. He wouldn't miss. He wouldn't miss any Rocket games. Is what I'm saying. Like they could, they could. Yeah, yeah, because he would. Then he would be sent down and play Friday, Saturday for the yeah, Rocket. That's it. Yeah, even, yeah, yeah. So, so they, yeah, wouldn't, they so, wouldn't necessarily have to send Barrett down. Right. Yeah, because they they don't have to limit themselves also with the number of players as yeah, long exactly. as you fit under the cap. Yeah. Uh, so. So we could end up in a situation where on Tuesday you would have Hudson playing on the left and Mayu playing on the right in at the Bell Center to finish the season. That would yeah. be that would be great. And you know, if it comes at the expense of Kovacevic, if it comes at the expense of I guess Baron, and then you move you move Harris to the right side, something like that, or maybe Gouli will be back. I don't know. Yeah. But if there's a chance for them to be both in the lineup. For that same idea of you know giving them a taste of the NHL before going to the summer, I think it'd be great. But uh, for now, there's no doubt that the the Rocket is in uh, dire straits. They're they're going to be. They have around the team Florian Jackey, who's been uh, who's been signed by the Montreal Canadiens rather hastily after Brentford was eliminated, uh -huh. and uh, we keep talking about unicorns in this. Uh, Uh, that's, in, that's, that's <laughs> in, in this podcast and around that team. But this is an intriguing prospect for me because, I mean, I look at the depth chart in the, uh, among the Canadians and in the Canadians organization, and there's not a ton of tough, bruising forwards, potential power forwards. I mean, if you look at guys, if you look at a, a, an iteration of the team where they could become – competitive in two or three years, you'll need guys that are scrappy, hard to play against, but also that can be better than Michael Pizzetta. Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of those guys in the organization. Right now in Laval, you got Lucas Condota. Will he be an NHL player one day? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. But Florian Jackai becomes, he has shown this year with his offensive outburst in the second half of the season, especially, That he's not just a scrapper. He's also a guy that knows how to play. He's got a good IQ. He can, can score goals, can play well around the net. Mm -hmm. So he, he becomes a very interesting guy for them. And Luke Tuck, if he's signed by the Montreal Canadiens, which, which might happen in the next few hours, who knows? Yeah. He's another guy. So those are two guys that could really help the Canadians from an, in terms of mixing the styles, mixing the types of players that you need to be a tough team to play against. Those two guys are very interesting. And I just hope, after, especially after seeing how lifeless some of the forwards were in that game against Cleveland on Thursday night, 
I hope that they give a chance to Florian Jackai uh, from now on in Laval and just to see, of course, he's that's one more kid, one more very, very green player. Uh, but you need a, a jolt of energy, a jolt of energy and somebody who's going to be able to uh, mess around a little bit, you know? Yeah, agreed. And uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely... Uh... Uh, he's promising for sure, and and yeah, we'll see what happens. But I mean, yeah, it's Laval's well, playoff situation being what it is. Um, they might, you know, if those games against Belleville wind up being irrelevant. What's interesting here is that both Rochester and Belleville are fighting for the for the number one seed in the yeah. division, um, which is. You know, hold on. You said both Rochester and Syracuse. Syracuse, yes, not Belleville. Yes. Both Syracuse. Oh, I said, did I say Belleville? I might have said Belleville. Yeah, yeah. you said Belleville. Sorry. Both Syracuse so both and Rochester. Both Rochester yeah. and Syracuse. Now, Belleville's three games prior to facing Laval, two in Rochester, one at home against Syracuse. The Marlies' next three games, two at Syracuse, one at Rochester. And so Rochester and Syracuse. <laughs> Hold just to make just Laval to make it easier. <laughs> yeah, Lo Rochester and Syracuse hold the key to, to Laval Rockets playoff hopes. Um, any Laval Rocket fans out there have to become huge Syracuse Crunch and Rochester Americans fans over the next two days. I mean, they're both Toronto is playing Syracuse tonight in Syracuse. Belleville is in Rochester tonight. They're both playing again on Saturday um, while Laval is playing in Cleveland, and so. You know, by the end of this weekend, we're going to know if Laval season is over or not. But, I mean, it's everyone. And then, obviously, Rochester and Syracuse flip spots and play Toronto and Belleville again. So, they are the two teams that will determine if Laval has anything to play for past this weekend. All right. Well, there you have it. Let's uh, let's wrap it up for today. Uh I'm glad that we have new storylines for the end of the season. That's fun. I think that the fans are also very happy. It's mm -hmm. not just debating, uh, you know, why is Christian Dvorak starting overtime or stuff like that. All right. Uh, okay. We'll be back on Monday for uh, yes. another edition of the Best You and Gada Notebook. Uh, why is Lars Eller then... starting overtime for the Penguins? It's a good question. Yeah. Kind of the same kind of deal. Anyhow, yes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry to interrupt your, your, your sign off. Carry on. That's fine. That's <laughs> fine. You know that sign off. Hey guys, uh, everybody, if you um, if you like our podcast, don't hesitate to uh, give it a five star rating uh, on Apple Podcasts, for example. If I don't know if there are, there might be other platforms where they have that star rating, so be generous, be and spread the word. Write some nice comments, and we're it. It makes it uh, easier through the the big algorithm machine. It makes it easier for people to find us. So um, spread the word and uh, we'll give you more of our words on Monday. And uh, we're going to have Monday mailbag on Monday. So feel free to send us your questions at Basu and Godin. That's our X handle and Basu and Godin at gmail.com. That's our email address where you can send endless messages. So thanks a lot, everybody. Have a nice weekend, everyone.